I just took a 30 hour train ride across Turkey in this seat and I want to tell you all about it. The good and the bad. It's called the Dogu Express and ever since videos of it travelling through the snow went viral in Turkey, it's famous for selling out in seconds. But if you are lucky enough to get a ticket, it will carry you 800 miles across the country, right over to Turkey's eastern border for the equivalent of just $12, making it a once in a lifetime opportunity to see parts of Turkey that most people don't even know exist for less than the price of three London tubes fares. And I finally managed to get a ticket, meaning that today I can show you what all the hype is about, whether or not traveling all the way out here alone in winter ended up being a good idea, and how I survived longer than an entire day on a Turkish train. My story starts in Ankara. Turkey's capital and home to millions of people. I've never been here before. It's my first ever day in the country and I'm already leaving the safety of the metropolis behind to travel solo to its very farthest border. This is my goal. Karas, an ancient town in desolate settings near to the Armenian border, where it's currently minus 10 degrees and where this newly famous train journey ends. I'm hoping to be rewarded for my foray into the unknown with good views, good memories and a glimpse of real life in this country away from the beaches and resorts and tourist destinations, but I'm also apprehensive. Maybe this is too much for my first trip in the country, especially considering that I speak no Turkish. Is this a good idea? All right, so I'm here in Ankara Gar. What a lovely classic train building with a lot of light and really clean for something in, you know, in the old school style. Seemingly quite a significant place as well. The Dogu Express still doesn't leave for another couple of hours, so I have time to grab something to eat before I get on. The famous, if in doubt, stop and eat falafel for a bit tactic seemed to be putting me in a better mood about it all. Not forgetting that, of course, a mega journey like this one deserves a fitting snack haul. A quick visit to a local supermarket and I walk back to the station with a bag of snacks and a dream. Just in time to see the Dogo Express pull up. Alright, let's go I guess. No time like the present. And so, into the metal tube that will be my home for the weekend. On first impressions, it seems far less rundown than you might expect from something that just runs back and forth through deserts and rocks for its whole life, and actually much more modern and clean than some trains I've been on that charge five times the price. This optimism carries me through the first minute or so until the inevitable reality sets in. Oh man, what have you done this time? How are you going to survive sitting in this seat for 30 hours? There's no turning back now though, and as we roll out of Ankara under the first of two sunsets that I'll be witnessing from this seat, I can't help but slip back into adventurous mode and get excited again about what's ahead of me. The train is pretty full and busy with locals, including in the seat behind me, one older Turkish gentleman in traditional clothing who I have no idea at this point is going to absolutely make my trip later. Apart from the legroom situation, which was actually okay, the seats were not that comfortable. They were pretty firm and I could tell that it was going to become a long night. To go this far for this price though, I was just grateful it even came with somewhere to sit. There is actually a carriage with four persons and shared sleeping compartments, but they are even harder to get tickets for. This route out to cars has existed for over a hundred years, but recently exploded in popularity after the snowy mountainous section in the east was featured in the documentary, leading to half the country taking the journey and posting it on Instagram. Upon seeing the hype and the sold out trains, Turkey played what can only be described as an absolute blinder by splitting the service in two. I'm on the Dogu Express, the original, normal train that still enables locals to get between the remote towns along the route at a fair price. But there's now also the touristic Dogu Express, with exclusively two bed sleeping cabins. That one is aimed at foreigners and even takes you on excursions at some stops, where the train waits for a few hours while they take you on a tour. And even with much higher ticket prices into the hundreds of dollars, the beds on the touristic version sell out within seconds of going online. I was working with a Turkish travel agency whose job is literally to get people on there and they could not get me a ticket, nor could they get me a bunk in one of the cheaper sleeping carriages on this normal train. The fact that the these seats on the normal train sell out much more slowly, allowing me to grab one, would seem to indicate that having to sit up all night puts off most sensible people. I, however, dived headfirst into the low-budget, non-horizontal option, which was already hitting me hard. The schedule is just set up in the most suspenseful way possible, with you getting on board in the evening all excited about the scenery to come and then just immediately having to push through the entire dark section up front. 
After a few hours of this, the monotony was eventually slightly broken up by the snack trolley's late night foray through the carriage. I bought this drink from a young member of staff with a waistcoat and tie on who very very graciously took the time to use Google Translate on his phone to make sure that I knew the opening hours of the cafe car. This cherry flavoured Tropicana drink caught my eye as something I'd never seen on sale before but I actually kind of ended up regretting it with its dry mouth effect leaving me feeling like I'd just drunk a non-alcoholic mulled wine or something. Nothing that reaching into the snack hall couldn't fix though as these peppercorn flavoured crisps or mini breadsticks or some kind of Turkish snack of some kind covered it up nicely and actually left me wishing I'd bought another pack for the next day. It was then that I realised that now was probably the cleanest the bathrooms would be for the duration of the journey and I headed to the end of the carriage to be greeted with two options, both squat style, both of which I'll uh, spare you the sight of. Sometimes nights like this just feel endless, unable to get comfortable wondering why they leave the bright carriage lights on all night, wondering why I continue to get myself in these situations and overall just waiting for the mercy of sunrise. But I was still grateful to be here at all and especially to be traveling with the real local option. The two people sat across from me are sharing a big bag of bread rolls from a bakery and at one point silently but very persistently offer me one. And the Turkish grandfather sat behind me smiles and nods each time we pass each other. I'm the only foreigner. The only one with whom nobody can communicate, but I'm still made to feel welcome. And that thought provides me with just enough good vibes to survive until the eventual sunrise. Made it is perhaps a strange thought to have when you still have a 14 hour train journey ahead of you, but I also knew that they're the good 14 hours now. The 14 hours that have made it famous. We make our first daylight stops at some towns that have presumably seen better days and begin to snake our way out into the arid and desolate landscapes of central Turkey. I head down to the cafe car to reward myself with some caffeine for making it through the night and I buy this bag of nuts and a Turkish coffee for 70 lira, or about $2, reminding myself with every sip that the best is yet to come, and of course, pinching myself remembering what I'd paid for my ticket. To have paid for my seat 400 Turkish lira, or about $12, to go all this way, so far on time, and to sit in a peaceful cafe car looking out at this beautiful part of the world, I mean it really is one of the greatest travel bargains I've ever seen. This train's name, Doryu Expressi, means Eastern Express, and while yes, it does go very far east, its use of the word express here is dubious at best. But I really did not mind at this point, noticing how creeping along so steadily and slowly lets you properly appreciate the landscapes and the towns that you're passing through. Places that you never would have seen if not for traveling across the country this way and cats in trees whose paths you will never cross again. Eventually, I become jealous of all the Turkish people around me eating plates of nice hot food and I try to order something more, but with the menu having such descriptive names as breakfast, I pretty soon realise that I'm going to have to be creative. Which brings me to another shout out to the guy in the cafe who was under absolutely no obligation to bother with me having a back and forth conversation about food over Google Translate, but he did do it and pretty soon I had paid about $5 for a tea and well, I didn't actually know, but some kind of food, I think. The best part of it absolutely came first in the form of this warm bread, which I would have eaten the whole kitchen's worth of if they had let me. And these fresh salad and olives made it feel like such a premium meal to be having on a train, especially off a real plate with a real knife and fork. I would have asked for no egg if I had known, but considering the communication issues and considering the price, this was a very good start to the day. This stretch of track leading us out to Eastern Anatolia is where the world's slowest express train very much enters its tunnel era, and the passenger experience becomes a game of trying to appreciate the nice view before it's taken away from you again and replaced by the inside of a tunnel. Eventually the outside world does come back, but 
sometimes not for very long. This mad run of tunnel bridge, tunnel, tunnel bridge just demonstrates the immense scale of the infrastructure project that it must have been to connect rural Turkey to Ankara. And it was actually really nice to have a front row seat to see that all of that work was worth it because it allows people from all walks of life to visit the capital and then get off this train again at such remote towns. And sometimes you come out of one of those tunnels to your first glimpse of the upcoming mountain range. Another unique and applaudable measure that Turkish railways clearly pay attention to is to properly clean the train windows, leaving all of the passengers free to share crystal clear photos of the views online. Well, clear except for this Turkish watermark, another genius branding decision that you rarely see. At our stop in Erzincan, a group of ladies get on that elsewhere I would probably have assumed were a prosecco fueled Hindu, but in a religious country such as this one, I'll simply describe as loud, happy, extroverted, and loud. As if by magic, the gigantic speaker by the cafe counter is turned right up and the carriage goes into party mode. Nobody can pass through anymore because the aisle is full of Turkish women dancing and the roof almost comes off when the previously very stern faced ticket inspector, who I could imagine definitely had some moves back in the 60s, briefly joins in. With that unfolding in front of me on one side, and a never-ending view of the sun-drenched mountains on the other, I can't help but smile at another scene that I was never supposed to witness. I could have stayed at home this weekend, and instead I'm in all of these people's memories as the random sleep-deprived Englishman at the next table. Eventually I reach a point where no amount of little cups of highly caffeinated Turkish tea can cover up how rough I feel, and I decide it's time to retreat away from the speaker to the peace, quiet and snacks of my seat. Waiting for me are these surprisingly thick dried apricots, a processed fruit bar, and these vaguely healthy tasting seeded crackers, all of which did actually make me feel a bit more human and alive. In my head, I had been saving this sparkling water as a home stretch treat this entire time, only to open it and find that, yeah, it was lemonade. That doesn't sound so bad, but it was actually quite disgusting and somehow powdery, as though whatever flavour was in there hadn't dissolved properly. To be fair, even to a non-Turkish speaker, the words limon aroma should have been a bit of a giveaway. We still have about five hours of the journey left as we begin to approach Erzurum, an ancient Silk Road trading city, where the well-dressed Turkish man behind me seems to be getting off. Despite us never even having tried to actually verbally communicate, I always got good vibes from him, which were confirmed when, just before his stop, he suddenly appears at my side having bought me a cup of tea. I hastily try to thank him in Turkish, and he smiles and gives me the tea and a firm handshake before the doors open and he steps off. <laughs> I even wave at him on the platform and he smiles and tries to wave back despite being laden with suitcases and I watch him get smaller and smaller as we pull away, amazed at how, even though we share no common language, I could very clearly understand his silent, welcome to Turkey, I hope you have a good trip in my country. Sitting watching the sun go down on this journey for the second time, I realised that while what brought me here was the hype, the seldom seen views, and the ever appealing narrative of travelling really far away, what I'll take home with me are all of these precious memories of little moments and the people on board that no amount of travel related stress, sleeplessness and back pain can take away from me. These good vibes carry me through for a while, but by 10pm, even the threat of a second night sat up in the darkness is really dragging me down, and I just do my best to push through a little longer to keep my eyes open and look out for the first signs of my destination. The end of the line, in the farthest east Anatolia. A remarkable journey, hard work at times, but definitely a good idea. Good night.
Oh god, I look like death in the screen. 